All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the fifth installment of our fall speaker series. Uh, thus far, we've hosted leading social scientists, computer scientists, and legal scholars who are deep in the weeds on key, uh, but often granular issues in each of their respective fields. Uh, we're hoping that this will be a bit of a different sort of conversation. Um, we're lucky to be joined today by Malcolm Harris and Eric Baker, who are two brilliant thinkers and writers. Uh, Malcolm is the author of the best-selling book, Palo Alto, A History of California, Capitalism and the World, uh, which he's here to discuss today. Uh, he's the author of two other books, including Kids These Days, The Making of Millennials, and is working on a new project titled Worth Living, Strategies Against Disaster and Despair. Uh, and Eric is a lecturer in the History of Science Department here at Harvard. He writes widely for magazines such as M Plus One, The Baffler, and The Drift, uh, where he's an associate editor, and is also working on a book project titled Make Your Own Job, The Entrepreneurial Work Ethic in Modern America. Uh, we'll set aside a portion of the conversation for audience questions, uh, so please feel free to drop them in the Zoom Q&A box below, um, and Eric will be keeping an eye out for any ones that are relevant for follow-ups or just points of clarification, so please also use the chat function. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Eric. Thanks so much, Nick, um, and, and thanks uh, for, for having me on. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this this great book. Um, you know, I, I was thinking that one, the, the proper place to start might be at the beginning, um, because one of the one of the things that excites me most about this book and, and that I think makes it um, so relevant, uh, you know, not just to discussions of Silicon Valley politics, but, you know, much wider range of, of political issues is um, the your, your decision to begin the, the narrative of the book with the, kind of the acceleration of, of Anglo settler colonialism um, in the 19th century. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people picking up this book, um, you know, might expect a, a much, much more kind of contemporary tale um but uh you know as, as someone who still holds out hope for the long array um style of, of history and, and thinks that settler colonialism is a really useful frame for for understanding so many developments in, in u.s history um i wondered if you could start by saying a little more about you know why why the book starts there and, and how you see those those themes kind of continuing um throughout the narrative yeah i so in some ways, I think I got really lucky with my object because, you know, I grew up in Palo Alto and I, I talk about that. Um, and I was probably able to sell this book as someone who doesn't have any graduate education, um, despite being a pretty straight up history book, because it's something that I have a personal uh, attachment to. At the same time, Palo Alto's officially history goes from the 1870s to today. And if you look at you know, American history and the work that's being done in American history right now, a lot of it is focused on this moment in the 1870s where you locate a sort of rebirth of the American project um, with the end of Reconstruction and the post-Civil War era. And that's often told around uh, the South and the North and the relation between the South and the North and uh, going from slavery to Jim Crow and that this is constitutive of the new country. But it really leaves out the story of the West, which is absolutely part of that same period. And so you have at the same time in the 1870s that you've got um, the defeat of Reconstruction going on in the South. You have genocidal militias conquering Alta California to establish California uh, as the other bound of this American coast to coast empire. And people think about this as like a, you know, an eastward march or a westward march rather from the east of uh American colonialism. But when you really read about California at the time, that's not how it operated. It was an over, it was literally an overseas colony of the United States um, in the middle of the 19th century, and it behaves like one. And so read this, focusing on Palo Alto as the object of this history allowed me to focus on this period of modernity that stretches from the 1870s to today, that is this second birth of the American project. Uh, so I, I feel really lucky that my, my object allowed me to, to focus on that period because it, it is very important and it is not, as some people imagine, ancient history. It's literally not ancient history. In fact, it's literally modern history that we're talking about. And I go through at the end, five generations of people, literally five generations of people um, since the 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 colonization by force of Alta California by Anglo-Americans. And so thinking about this as modern history and the world as the development 
uh, of this project from the late 19th century, uh, I think cast the whole, our whole present situation in a different light. Yeah. Could you say more about that last point, you know, in, in terms, in terms of the, the, you know, uh, what people like to call a you know, conjunctural analysis of our, our sort of present, present moment. Um, how does this uh, sort of reminder, you know, as, as you said, there's a great riff at the, at the end about these sort of cycles of forgetting, um, you know, so how does, how does sort of working to, to overcome um, the, those sort of roll, roll back those cycles of forgetting one by one, all the way to this sort of original moment of, of settlement and, and genocide um, in terms of, you know, sort of our understanding our, our, our current um, moment and the, the, the political crises we confront ourselves today. Yeah. Uh, so uh, on one level, just in terms of the colonization of Turtle Island of North America, it's important for people to understand these as ongoing struggles that are that are contemporary, right? Whether that's uh, Muwekma land in the Bay Area, um, where the tribe of over 600 people is still fighting to restore their federal recognition and restore a land base, um, that this is something contemporary and they can count those five generations very, very clearly. Uh, or whether you're looking at the Black Hills, right? That the, the, the colonization of vast amounts of North America happens in this modern period and are disputes that are ongoing that are continue through the 20th century and now into the 21st century and in some ways are the places where we see sparks uh right now politically so when you see the, the keystone xl uh protests and you think like oh you know this is a really where is this coming from there's this strange you know political eruption happening in this place that doesn't seem like a political flashpoint in terms of our understanding of the, the current array of forces. Like why, why would there be a political clash there? But if you understand this history of modern settler colonialism, you're like, of course, the, of course the struggle for the Black Hills has never ended. Um, of course the Aseti Sokoan are still struggling for their territory and will continue to struggle as there are new encroachments. Uh, at the same time, I've been thinking a lot about it as we look at Palestine uh, and the war going on right there, that it's the exact same uh, history. And people, there's been the effort from, from some, especially on the Zionist side, to say that the use of settler colonialism and the models of settler colonialism to talk about Palestine and Israel uh, is an imposition of some other archetype or some, some other conflict from the North American slash Australian slash New Zealand context um, and to put it onto Israel Palestine so that those of us on the left can under, understand it easier. Uh, this is completely false. It's historically illiterate. And anyone who's a historian of this modern period will tell you as, as much uh, that these colonization projects, not just California and Australia and New Zealand, but also uh, South Africa, also in uh, coastal China, that these are all things that are happening at the same time in Peru. Um, and they're doing so with Californian engineering expertise that's forged in the era of gold mining and accumulates in places like Stanford University and Palo Alto. And so uh, one historical link that people might not know about is this guy, Elwood Mead, who's one of the, he's the leader of the first Bureau of Reclamation. He's the guy who's really responsible as much as anyone in particular for designing the West's water system. So Mead- The, the namesake uh, of Lake Mead. Lake right? Mead, which is still the, the, the water source for California. It's attached to the Hoover Dam, you know, they're like, this is, and that's settlement, right? People need to understand, that's 20th century, but that's, that's settlement. They're settling the land for uh, more people to be able to live there. Uh, Elwood Mead in the, in the 20s and 30s goes over to Palestine, where he's doing the, the same activity there, where they want him for his expertise, having done this work in California, to go set up a, a Zionist water system. And it's interesting that, that uh, he's credited by some of the, the early Zionist leaders with leading them away from communal design into individualist, uh, a capitalist economy. That he comes out there and says like, you guys don't trust me, like communism, like this all like working together, living together thing, uh, sharing the land, like 
that's never going to help you develop anything. That's what the Arabs have been doing for hundreds of years. It's never going to build anything. What you need is capitalism. And they say, oh, okay. And then this becomes the dominant strain within uh, Zionist settlement, uh, as well as the, the structural building of the, the like, literal infrastructure of the colonial project. Uh, so these, these connections are not metaphorical. They're not uh, like archetypical, they're literal. It's literally the same personnel who are involved in this global project of colonialism that again is within a hundred years. This is our current situation. It seems to me that it really kind of recasts, you know, the, the in some ways the, the central uh, concept of, of Silicon Valley technology, um, you know, that you really sort of draw out um, you know to the the relationship of technology on the one hand to infrastructure and the the physical technical um, remolding of 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 places and, and infrastructural systems that that goes into settlement. Yeah, and not just that. When we think about technology, especially when we think about Silicon Valley technology, it's really easy to think about gadgets because it's a real it's a real place of gadgets and these like gadget commodities really seem to crystallize all the like um the historical development that's going on in these places the intellectual development the capital and they seem like you know like all of this came together and we produced uh the microchip or we produced the computer or we produced the television which also comes out of uh the same group or the the, the telegraph you know triodes uh that they were coming up with or radar, you know, there are a lot of very important uh, like gadgets that they come out that come out of there. Um, but what that leaves out is the way that these commodities also crystallize the social relations um, and the, in the history. And so when we focus on science and technology in terms of the invention, in terms of the like the ideal, the concept behind these things, it's very easy to think about them. Um, as separate from labor, as separate from land, uh, as separate from class. And so with something like the Apple II, there is, a, a, I think, a recent book about the, the Apple II that talks about it, uh, a whole book about this object and the importance of this object. It doesn't talk about who built them in practice. Doesn't in, in no, almost none of the histories of the tech industry, maybe the histories that a lot of people who are watching this uh, might be familiar with, um, industrial histories of the Bay Area, they don't talk about who builds, you know, Apple II number seven or number eight. They talk about who wires the first one, um, and then they don't worry about the actual production process. But the actual production process was, uh, at least as much as the design, the important technological step that happens in the Bay Area. So when you think of the Bay Area now, uh, and it was like, oh, they invented gig work. Like that was a really important like thing that they came up with, but that was just an extension of these, the phone or this object or whatever. It just naturally unfolded for that from there. That's not true at all. Like before Silicon Valley invented gig work, Silicon Valley was the world center of temp work, uh, which is a, a different kind of precariously contracted labor. And so, and before that it was, uh, the center of different kinds of labor contracts of like transnational labor contractors and stuff. So those, these innovations in labor All have this kind of non-union, non-union casual, you know, hyper intensified sort of form that persists even as the, the exact organizational details evolve. Absolutely. I mean, even look at the, the Fremont uh, auto factory, which is going, going to be in the news soon, I imagine, um, that is currently a, a big Tesla factory. But before that was the new me. Um, when I was in high school, when I visited it on a auto class field trip, uh, it was the new me, new me uh, factory run by Toyota, which was supposed to bring back the like American auto uh, union worker, even if they were going to be sort of working for Japanese companies. Uh, it was supposed to bring back the the union building uh, that collapsed and is now run by Tesla, which is a non-union automaker. Um, and the UAW is now threaten threatening to unionize the, uh, the Fremont plant. But one thing that's really interesting about the Fremont plant that gets left out of that, most of the histories of California and of the auto industry, is that that plant was one of the big winners of Prop 13, 
which was the, the tax reform um, proposition that is usually, we talk about it in terms of individual home property taxes and not in terms of the, the businesses that won huge tax reductions as part of this proposition. But one of those businesses was the Fremont factory that then went kaput as part of the evolution of social relations that come out of the uh, destruction of those relations in the first place, right? If you destroy the state that they with the taxes, uh, then you can't support the auto worker uh, social labor model. You, you I, I'm glad that you that you pivoted there because one one piece, and again thinking about these these continuities that stretch back to the 19th century, um, the the word that you use again and again to characterize this sort of ballot proposition strategy that um, a lot of the the, the business class, um, really adopts in the, the late 20th century in the U.S. is vigilantism, mm. sort of these vigilante initiatives. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about, you know, why you you characterize these these ballot initiatives as a, a kind of form of, of vigilantism and, and, you know, how maybe that connects with some of these earlier um, episodes of, of vigilantism. Yeah, California has a, a fantastic history of vigilantism. Actually, um, Mike Davis, it's like somewhere between uh, an essay and a short book. Uh, Mike Davis has one called like, What is a Vigilante Man? That is about the history of white vigilantism in uh, California. And someone really should put that out as like a pamphlet. I think it's published in another book as a chapter or something. But someone should really put that out as a pamphlet because it's this really great history. Um, and you can go back to the 19th century uh, to the like very beginning of the labor movement in California, the official labor movement, where they decide to attack uh, Chinese workers um, and the importation of Chinese workers uh, as, as their strategy. And they look towards vigilantism as a solution. And really, you could go back further than that uh, to the idealization of the gold mining camps themselves which was a formalization of vigilantism uh, based on the racial exclusion of non-white, non-Anglo people, um, which at the time was did not just mean non-racially white or whatever. It also included like French people or whatever. It was, you know, get the hell off our, our camps or you have to pay a special tax. And uh, so whiteness is really fused uh, with these vigilante activities um, and in the 20th century, it becomes a labor tactic um, that the, the growers use, uh, where they're building their own vigilante forces that they can rely on. And the California Highway Patrol really evolves out of these vigilante gangs that are used to attack at those point. Um, I, I guess you could say mostly Chicano workers, um, but there's also Fil Filipino workers um, and Korean and Japanese and Chinese workers who are being attacked by these these vigilante groups as well. Um, and so it becomes this like this racial labor tool um, that then when it be, uh, in more in the post-war era looks for these legalistic solutions. In addition to, I mean, you, and you see, do see a resurgence of the Klan activity in California in the 70s and 80s, especially around the border. Um, so vigilantism continues, but it is also really built into the California political system and the ways that those propositions, uh, state propositions operate is definitely within that history of um, white extra democratic democratic uh, domination. It seems that there's an analogy there as well, you know, talking about the, the evolution of anti-labor vigilantism into the highway patrol, um, that one one important piece to, and for thinking about the infrastructural reshaping of, of California in this period is, is the, the growth of the, the explosive growth of the prison system, which you discuss a bit drawing on Ruth Wilson Kilmore and, and other scholars. Um, but what, you know, how, when we, when we think about, you know, the, the Silicon Valley economy, you know, we, we think, we tend to think about, you know, people in sort of open plan offices, um, you know, chugging coffee and, and on their computers, but, you know, a, a huge um, fraction of, of the working class in California are either, you know, incarcerated in prisons or employed in the prison system. Yeah. And the, uh, 
something I think that's really, and I cite, uh, there's a, there's a footnote in the, <laughs> the Gilmore book that I think is really important, uh, where she says, this is not Keynesianism. That, and she differentiates and, and she says that something had to replace the in economic system that include, found ways to include, even if um, on the margins, uh, minority groups within American society. Um, and then that this was the post-war Keynesianism and the Great Society. And some people talk about the prison boom as sort of an extension of that. And Gilmore is, is very, very clear, even though it's in an end note, uh, that this is not the case and that this is a, a distinct mode that she thinks sees of uh, population management. And in my research, I think it's pretty much impossible to understand that other than as a distributed revenge plot uh, against uh, black and Chicano people in the United States and in, in particular in California uh, for the insurrections of the 60s and early 70s. Uh, and that you see that this is a, that they are intentionally destroying the ability of the state to reproduce itself, um, particularly targeted around education. So if you look at California in, you know, the final quarter of the 20th century and the emergence of the knowledge economy and like the center of the world knowledge economy, the last thing you would do is totally eviscerate your education system, right? Like that makes absolutely no sense if you're investing in your future as a like place in the world, except that the, the authorities of California really understand, understood what kind of world they were trying to create at the end of the 20th century. And it was one that was based on the capital, the total capitalist domination of labor. Um, and so that was the, you were going to grow not by educating people in the, educating the masses into new computer skills, um, but by hammering people, by hammering labor and forcing wages down and, and exporting jobs that were technically complicated uh, to other places where you could attack those wages or importing technically sophisticated workers who would be dependent on the immigration system and hammer down their wages. Uh, but if you look at the, the descriptions of the California primary and secondary education system from, you know, the 40s, 50s to the 70s, 80s, it can, it can only be read as uh, intentional, I think, because you, you go from people saying like, wow, this is the best, you know, like multiracial education. We're really learning to all be Americans and like the teachers really value everyone's culture and it's not a like supremacist sort of like situation. Um, Ernesto Galarza, who's a, a great labor figure, has this uh, in his book, Barrio Boy, a uh, really great account of what it was like to go to school in California in, for a young Chicano boy uh, in the first half of the 20th century. And then you read about what education looks like for black kids in the Bay Area in the 80s. Uh, and they say, yeah, I go to school every day and it doesn't matter. They're not going to teach me how to read. So like, what's the point? And it's a, it's a, I can only read that as a political attack on people. I mean, the, this framing of, of revenge or retaliation um, as particularly sort of taking its, as its object, the education system, um, reminds me of how much the, uh, the university infrastructure, I mean, especially at Stanford, um, but also to a certain extent Berkeley in this area was, was both the, the target of, um, uprising and, and political mobilization in the, the 60s and 70s, but also, you know, to, to a significant extent became kind of um, conscripted, or at least was, was threatened to be uh, sort of um, uh, utilized by um, revolutionary movements um, that, that won the sympathy of a, at least a minority of, of the, the, the white student population. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... You know, maybe people uh, read an article in the or an excerpt recently from Michael Kazin's new mes memoir, uh, where he talks about being part of SDS at, at Harvard and being kind of a, a, a feckless pseudo radical. Um, and maybe that was the the situation at Harvard. I, I didn't research that campus very well, but I can say say for sure that that was not the case at Stanford, and that the the movement which was really drawing its inspiration from the Black Panthers, from the street movements, um, and from the community college movement uh, in 
Northern California at the time, which was really at the cutting edge of, of politics and of uniting the street and educational politics. Um, and they were, they were drawing their inspiration from there and they were really serious people. Um, and I talk about that. I do a lot of, um, research in the book talking about the the 60s movement and the, the revolutionary guard and the, the the would-be communist revolutionaries the late 60s early 70s um, particularly at Stanford and these were these were uncommonly sophisticated thinkers uh, who put their skills to work researching the relationships between their campus community and the war that they found unacceptable going on in Vietnam. And they found a lot of connections and they found a lot of serious connections. And they, they found that a lot of the electronics research that was being done on their campus, uh, ostensibly for defensive purposes or whatever, or ostensibly just for like scientific, uh, objective scientific purposes, were in fact part and parcel of the war machine and that the war was being fought on their campus right around them at that building over there where they didn't know what they were doing in there. Well, it turns out they were doing uh, calculations that were being used uh, in Vietnam and what those students decided to do pretty quickly. I mean, was insert themselves uh, into this conflict and they start by trying to, you know, put their bodies between things. They go sit outside of the, the uh, military manufacturers. There's a great scene where the student left gets a person-to-person -person meeting with the CEO of one of the uh, chemical companies that's making the chemicals that's being used in Vietnam. And it's a very interesting scene, partly because both the, the CEO and the student leaders are both Jewish. And the Holocaust is a really recent memory. And the student leaders are saying like, you know, you're working with the same companies that produce the gas for the gas chambers. Like this is the, you're doing the same thing when you're producing Agent Orange or you're producing Napalm. Uh, and the CEO of the, the weapons company says like, look, man, I'm just trying to end the war faster. And like, this is what chemical companies do. And if I didn't do it, then someone else would do it. Uh, and the student radicals pretty quickly realize like, okay, fuck this. Like we're not going to get anywhere like negotiating with these guys or appealing to their humanity. They realize that it is indeed an inhuman system. They, they believe the things that they're being told, uh, by the CEO cause they're true. Like if he quits, someone else is going to do it. And so that they realize that it's not enough to object or to protest they have to resist. And so what they do is they start bombing uh, and setting fire to and sabotaging these campus systems that were doing war work. Uh, and they are, they are effective. They uh, target every computer on campus. And that's one of the, the historiographical points about the book that I think was pretty interesting is a lot of the histories of Silicon Valley say that like, oh, the hippies were anti-war and they created the computers because they were pro-technology and then maybe they accidentally didn't neoliberalism. Uh, but the actual anti-war movement like literally was trying to blow up every computer in the country. <laughs> like that was that was their their program because they recognized that all these computers were war machines. Um, so I think that's something we need to understand a little more clearly. And that, of course, stretches, you know, both uh, forward in, in time from that moment as, as well as backwards. And, and you, you talk a lot about the, the entanglement, um, you know, of, I mean, in, in some ways, this goes back to the, the, the period of settlement. Um, but, you know, as well through Herbert Hoover, who looms very large in, in this book, this pattern of, you know, association um, with, the, with the state and the military. Um, then you draw that forward at the end and about um, talking about Palantir and uh, contemporary Silicon Valley's um, cooperation with the uh, the NSA is, is you know revealed by various whistleblowers. Um, so it seems like this is a, a sort of major theme in uh, you know, looking for areas of, of continuity up to the the, the present day. Um, you know this this narrative of uh, which I I completely agree that there was a sort of initial kind of utopian element um, that was that was uh, used conceived of as sort of tools of peace that you know eventually sort of fell away and you know were, were corrupted and it's interesting how this narrative sort of gets repeated sort of at each stage of 
of this process, you know, but not just in the Cold War, but it's it's exactly the same sort of narrative beats that people talk about, you know, the all this this social media was, you know, supposed to bring about, you know, peace in the Middle East or something. And, um, you know, but it, it, it wound up these, there was this sort of element of co-option or, you know, sort of downfall. Um, and I think that one of the things that the book does effectively is sort of push back against that, that narrative of sort of initial purity, um, mm. which we sort of repeated um, again in this sort of almost like ritual forgetting way. We, we forget that we've sort of played out the, the beats of this, of this story uh, before. Yeah, when people talk about the the early internet, I mean, maybe this is the the best example of that kind of uh, self flattering history historical narrativizing by the the industry, which is that when you think about the the networks that preceded the internet um, that connected all the networks or whatever, uh, when you think about early computer networks. You think of like hobbyists and enthusiasts and the like spread of information, but also like artists and goofballs and hippies and like Grateful Dead fans loom like super, super large in this history. Um, I had a few people who are mad that the Grateful Dead did not play a larger role uh, in this book, but sort of fewer than I than I worried I might get because they're. Did, did they ever play Palo Alto? They're from Palo Alto. They are oh, Palo Alto. Huh? Oh, yeah. Like 100%. Yet I sort of left that out of the book because uh, who cares? Um, because it is not actually because the, you know, because that those networks did not actually characterize. I just realized my, my whole thing is a little tilted here. That's okay. I'm to the left. Um, that the, the early internet networks, you know, for some people might have been characterized by this, like sharing of information or cross distances or whatever. But in terms of their use, in terms of like how what was really important historically, it was the use by the defense uh, establishment. And so I talk about the, the network, one of the early computer networks was a network that Oliver North set up uh, using the first laptops um, which did not have a big market, but the national security establishment, you know, this is if you look, go back to like movies from the eighties or nineties or whatever, you open up the laptop and it's the like, uh, orange types, uh, command line screen or whatever. Uh, like the really, really early, uh, but very high tech at the time. And he used this to set up a shadow government. Like the Iran Contra scandal would not have been possible except for that they had these new generation of laptops that allowed like eight people to run a government um, that they didn't have to go through the actual military's like communication systems, which would have involved mo many more people being involved in this plan. Instead, they're able to set up the with plausible deniability for the White House, a, a different government. <laughs> and that's done through this computer network. That connect that's going to connect you know Nicaragua to Lebanon to Angola to Afghanistan to the NSC in the White House uh, to Taiwan uh, you know where they create this anti-communist international that's moving around guns and money um, and information in ways that are not under democratic oversight that are against the law but that were crucially important to creating the world that we end up with at the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Um, and that for me, that like that blows the grateful dead out of the water, right? Like the ability capital's ability at that moment uh, to put together a counterforce to the global communist insurgency is absolutely crucial for the survival, especially for the unipolar survival of American led capitalism in the world. Like, it's hard to imagine how that happens without that ability to sort of move resources around the world uh, through its systems unaccountably. And, and move messages, you know, information. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, the, in, in many ways, the, the, when you were enumerating the gadgets, you know, earlier, the, there's so much, so much that's, um, and obviously, sort of broadly construed telecommunications is the sort of mm -hmm. central, um, the uh, sort of unifying um, uh, sector that that these you know innovations that that we all come come to know. Um, 
are are clustered in and you know to to some extent there's like a sort of fun you know consumer facing you know element to the that gadgetry but you know it's uh, i mean your sort of description of the the north network is a it's a good reminder that you know the increasing importance um of uh you know telecommunication infrastructure and in coordinating imperial projects and going back to the 19th century um coordinating the expansion of, of of capitalism the creation of a world market the annihilation of of space by time and marx's phrase uh yeah you can look at i mean hewlett packard is one is one of the signature companies of palo alto going back to their radio era so they they precede uh Silicon in Silicon Valley, right? They were working with vacuum triodes back in the day. Um, total like conscious product of Stanford University, of that milieu, of even that military project um, to, to win World War II um, and World War I before it. Uh, it really comes out of the World War I orientation into World War II. Uh, Hewlett Packard now uh, has been in the news as one of the targets of the, the BDS campaign because of their military work uh, on behalf of the Israeli government. And people might think like Hewlett Packard, like don't they, they sell, they sold those old, like, you know, tower PCs. What do they have to do with like military contracting or whatever? Uh, that's not the case. Like they were a military contractor, like way, way, way before. Um, and in fact, like, David Packard himself is deputy deputy secretary of defense um, under Nixon during the Vietnam war. He is one of the like real enemies of the student movement um, in the sixties and seventies. We don't remember that, that now because HP has done a really good job uh, cleaning up their image. But one of the things that David Packard was really, really aggressive about was uh, cutting export restrictions on communications technologies to governments that we were worried about, that some people within the government were worried about having these technologies. And so he was the one saying like, no, no, no you gotta let me sell these, you know, signals monitoring systems to Savak, the Iranian special police uh, for the Shah that were using them to round up and kill people. Um, or you gotta let me sell, you know, sell these systems to Idi Amin. You gotta let me sell these systems to, uh, whatever anti-communist uh, dictators wanted them, which was all of them, absolutely all of them. Uh, and so from, from that time, from the very beginning, uh, HP has been an important element in the like anti-communist international uh, so far that one of the guys who sort of starts the, the private facing um, firm that really runs the whole Iran Contra scandal is an HP distributor who's working is an Iranian guy who's working for HP out of their office in um, Switzerland, whose main job was like bribing Iranian officials to buy HP uh, technology. Um, and then he gets co-opted by North and the intelligence uh, establishment into expanding that operation such that they're, you know, taking heavy artillery that was seized by the Israelis in Lebanon and bringing it to South America to fight Contras, you know. So it becomes a, uh, a real worldwide scheme, but people don't associate Palo Alto or Silicon Valley or any of those tech companies with this stuff that was going on in the eighties, which is very interesting. Cause if you go back and watch all those movies, like, you know, cold war type espionage movies, it's very, very, very clear how crucial tech is to the whole thing. Like there's always some, Oh, we got to get this chip. Like, you know, the chip is really where it's at, you know, whatever we got to get this information. Uh, and Silicon Valley during the cold war is this real like global center of spy craft been rewatching the uh the show the americans and um there's there's a lot of sort of vintage computer stuff that um you know i mean i i think is one thing that that show captures well um but the 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 you know we we've kept talking um about you know uh i mean even, even in, in what you just said people don't think about this when they when they think about palo alto um and so that this makes me think of one of the questions that's that's come into us about ideology. You know, we've we've talked a lot about material infrastructure, 
um, the the you know flows of of capital of of people of of technology. Um, but this person is is curious about the role of uh, ideology in in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, is is this just a matter of you know deception hype, or is is there something more that we could say about the the kind of active productive role of of uh, Silicon Silicon Valley ideology? Uh, I would say it's overstated, and so one of the one of the reasons I don't look at uh, ideology very much in the book is because in the official history, I think they really center on ideology. Uh, there's a, a funny essay called The Californian Ideology that people might be surprised not to see referenced anywhere in the book. Um, but that's because I think that essay is really bad and wrong uh, and gets the history wrong. And if you now look back on, if you read interviews with the authors, uh, They'll say like, oh yeah, we weren't really talking about California and what was going on in California. We were talking about like our idea of California from our British media studies MA program that we were trying to recruit from. And that ha that has then like described, people have confused that with like what was actually going on in California. And that's how you end up thinking like, oh, the hippies invented the computer or whatever. And it was about neoliberalism instead of being like, Oliver North invented the computer to overthrow the Sandinistas, which is like much more accurate than the first one, even though they're both simplifications or whatever. Um, so as a Marxist, I don't think of the like ideology as the actually determining um, of, of history. I think it's a more of a secondary factor. Um, and I think if you review the the actual history of California, you find that as well. And so a lot of people have asked like, oh, why don't you talk about all these cool ideas that Leland Stanford had about how like everyone should be in workers co-ops or whatever. And I was like, because they're irrelevant, like some some like fantasy that some capitalist had and Silicon Valley of capitalists, you know, have a lot of fantasies. Right. And if we focus on the fantasies that they have, we really miss like what they're actually doing all day. And they might not understand what they're actually doing all day. Half the time, at least half the time, they do not understand what they're doing all day in terms of the like uh, historical context. And so I really want to know what, what's going on behind people's backs, you know, like historically, rather than like what they think they're doing, especially because uh, Silicon Valley is really, really good at telling its own story about what it's doing. Um, and sort of bad at remembering its own history. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it makes me think there's a, a question that just came in about um, Martin Scorsese's new film, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, um, uh, which I think one of one of the interesting things that that film does, which is also you know about settler colonial genocide in a different part of the country, um, is is to kind of take the the sort of like the suspense out of it and to to sort of show that um, you know a lot of this, uh, which was you know the the, the book, a, a lot of people were expecting a sort of like mystery kind of style um, presentation of, of this material, but it's it's out in the open. It's it's not a um, it, it it doesn't it doesn't you know it requires to a certain extent you know less sort of detective work with all of the kind of carceral baggage of, of that phrase and um, more just a, a kind of willingness to actually look in the face um the, the historical record yeah i haven't i haven't watched it yet i have read the book um I'll, I'll be i'll be curious um one movie i did see recently is a documentary called the lakota nation versus the united states i believe that's what it's called uh, which is a, a really great history of the the colonization of the black hills um in through today and it's exactly parallel to the show deadwood which i just also just seen some of for the first time um which takes place in the same in the same place exact same history but from the the colonizer perspective and putting those two in conversation together i thought was really 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 interesting uh because you really see how much work goes in even contemporarily into just not seeing native people um and not understanding their history and not recognizing their perspective uh, as a human one period, because once, once you crack that open, once you recognize the, the humanity of native people, 
then it's really hard to see the humanity of settlers. Like someone's humanity gets thrown into question because of what actually happened. Um, Cause it's hard to imagine two groups of human people uh, tr treating each other that way. Right. Um, and so from what I've read of the new movie, uh, I think that it sort of struggles with that, right? Like how do you show both groups uh, as human at the same time when the settlers have behaved uh, what we think of as with a lack of humanity. Um, so hopefully it represents a step forward in that thinking and a step forward in terms of understanding the history of settler colonialism as a modern, thoroughly modern, constitutively modern history. Yeah. Um, which is a good segue to a, a, another question about um, what is to be done, which is which is where the the, the book ends with the the, the sort of uh, modest modest proposal. I think it's modest in the grand scheme of things, of uh, sort of um, giving the Stanford land back. Um, uh, but the the this question asks, um, what would you suggest uh, to address the complexities and consequences of uh, settler movements and, and settlements in the in the present. Um, there's another related question about um, uh, sort of uh, more theoretical academic ideas about um, refusal and ideas of um, uh, indigenous data sovereignty. Um, you know, is, is what what kind of uh, approaches do you do you find promising for kind of envisioning um, a path forward in, in our moment? Yeah, I think uh, native leadership is is clearly uh, the path forward. So I think people, there's been sort of uh, pathetic conversations about how settlers in North America should relate to indigenous movements. And this sort of like, oh, if you believe in anti-colonialism, then why don't you like cut your own throat at the doors of the Bureau of Indian Affairs or whatever, you know, like, why don't, why don't you like sacrifice your own settler being uh, to the native movement? Uh, or like, why don't you like let them murder you or something? Which is like a really like totally insane thing to say, especially because again, these are contemporary political movements that you can become involved in. It, it's like, no one's going to say like, oh no, we don't want your help because you're a settler or whatever. It doesn't mean that like, you're not going to lead the movement for land back in the place that you're from or whatever, but there are absolutely 110% plenty of opportunities from people of all backgrounds to contribute to the native cause, uh, wherever they are, when they're from. So if you're watching this from the San Francisco Bay area, from Muwekma land, go to muwekma.org, M-U-W-E-K-M-A.org. Uh, and learn about the campaign to restore recognition to the tribe, you know, like learn about what the actual campaigns are in the place that you're from or in the place that you're living uh, and build up actual relationships to the people doing that work. Uh, and then there, and there are a lot of answers, right? There are like as many answers as there are uh, campaigns and as many answers as there are places um, that these are like, place-based campaigns and we need to understand them as place-based campaigns as land defense as water defense as earth care um and that's that's a lot of what my next book is going to be about so hopefully i'll have some answers for people about uh where i see leadership coming from uh in this moment and going on to the future but yeah like learn about what's actually going on where you are in as opposed to like thinking about these things in terms of like really abstract rights, because that's not how this question in particular functions. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and, and not just, not just politically, but in, in some ways also um, the, the, the kind of um, the, what the, what the book shows um, the, the kind of embedding of, um, or the, the sort of very material dependence of um, current, you know, regimes of of capitalist exploitation within the um, the the metropole of you know exploitation of of settler workers um, itself depends in this in this um, longer history of settler colonialism, ongoing processes of, of dispossession and exploitation in the global south. Um, which, uh, there's a, a a question that alludes to um, the theme of bifurcation um, in the, the the book and in the in the lab the labor market. 
um, you know, it, it seems that the, you know, not only is it is it possible, not only is it a good idea on, on political grounds, but, you know, the, the idea that it's, it's, it, that it's even possible to sort of address, um, you know, the exploitation of the, the labor aristocracy, um, so to speak, uh, without engaging, um, you know, broader questions of imperialism and, and ongoing presence of settler colonialism seems to me to be quite naive. Yeah, and this well, it's a, I think it goes to this question of uh, class abstractionism versus class dynamism, and is class uh, class membership and class interests something that just exists, and we need to like ignore all the confounding uh, elements of our lives that might uh, suggest that we join some other kind of political collectivity, and just focus on our existence uh, as members of the proletariat, as non-capitalists, as workers. Uh, or is it is it a activity that we have to do? Do we have to build class forces uh, by bringing those common interests to the fore? Uh, Stephanie Barca has a really interesting way of thinking about it, where she talks about the common interest in the preservation of the earth that unites both industrial and what she calls meta-industrial workers. Um, other people call care workers or other kinds of workers. Uh, non-productive or however you want to do it, uh, but that, that that interest in the preservation of the earth has to be created, that it doesn't just, it's not self-evident uh, to people. Uh, I saw a, a clarification in the chat. It was uh, Stephanie Barca. I happen to have her book right here, The Forces of Reproduction by Stephanie Barca, uh, where she talks about that question very directly. And I think it does a really good job of of talking about how we need to build class belonging as a uh, political element within society, not just sort of say, okay, all, all workers have worker class interest and therefore the things that workers do are the things that are in their worker class interest, which I think is, uh, leads people into some cul-de-sacs, which we've seen where like, you know, if you say that the IBEW is the revolutionary subject that's going to um, build itself and build public power at the same time. And then the IBEW some, comes out and says like, we think there should be more fossil fuel powered crypto mines. Like th those people should probably not be in charge of like planning the entire society. Right. And so if you're like, uh, if your model is question begging and it's not uh, actually attached to what's going on in the real dynamics then that shows that we need to like be intervening in this, that it needs to be a political process, not something that we can just assume. And I think that that's one thing that the, the, the again, the kind of long durée historical perspective of the book is really useful for, for illuminating um, because class can look like this static abstraction, you know, from the perspective of, of, you know, one conjuncture. Um, but when you, you zoom out and, um, you know, you take a look at these dynamic processes and unfolding in, in history, it becomes, I think, a, a bit clearer the the impossibility of sort of pinning pinning it down and saying, you know, there there is is the the kind of the real the real class that we need to sort of mold, you know, um, re recognize, strip away all the sort of you know whatever identity based baggage that sort of presents us from seeing this sort of essence. Yeah, I think it's it's not a coincidence that Mike Davis is both the great historian of class dynamism within the American context, as well as the great his, radical historian of California. Um, that California just has so many exam examples of how that project uh, can succeed and fail, and the just the way that class is so totally variegated from the very, 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 very beginning. Uh, not just by gender, though certainly by gender, and not not just by race, though certainly by race, but also by language, by immigration status, uh, by country of origin, by like by region of origin, by race slash ethnicity. Right? If, like the first uh, restrictive immigration law was the Page Act, which didn't just before Chinese exclusion uh, banned Asian women in particular. And so we like from the very, very beginning, like the, the formation of the working class in California uh, 
in this Anglo-American history is so totally dynamic um, across all these other tons of variables uh, that it's impossible to think of class as just something that you can extract from the labor capital relation. So that that leads me to my my final question, and then we can wrap up. the The subtitle of this book is "A History of California Capitalism and the World." Um, I'm wondering if you know, th thinking about again, thinking about our our understanding of of um, our our current conjuncture and what's to be done, as well as the history, the sort of uh, relative priority of these of these concepts. Um, you know, is is California the 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 fulcrum, um, or is California uh, a useful collection of of examples, um, or is it a, a secret third thing? Yeah. So I originally, I think that the original title was uh, I just had California capitalism in the world. You know, very much more like academic or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I, the the publisher was like not quite feeling it, and I looked through a bunch of other like books that sold have sold a bunch of copies or whatever, and I said, what if we put in the word history right there? And I nailed it. History of California capitalism in the world. Like you got it. Um, it's a it's a like expanding right. So California capitalism in the world. You get bigger and bigger. It's a little like intentionally funny or whatever. Um, but I. California is this puzzle piece that completes the capitalist world uh, as a world system for the first time. Uh, it really is this hinge that, that allows the, the, the world capitalist system to exist. And California goes from being the furthest hinterland as far as the world is considered. California is the end of the world. Uh, as far as the world system is concerned. And it goes very, very, very quickly from being one of the least developed places to being the center of this new system. Uh, and so in some ways, capitalism and the world itself, the world as a, as a place that understands itself as such, uh, proceed from California. Uh, Partly just sounds nice, um, but I think it really does. It does describe my my object, um, and I think people people have been interested in it, seeing California in terms of uh, world history rather than America. Notice that America is not in the the subhead. A good a good reminder of the the, the possibility of uh, everything to change very quickly. Uh, no doubt. Over... Um, well, thank you. I, I think that um, we're going to wrap up here. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, as we sort of prefaced at the beginning, we were hoping this would be a different sort of conversation, look at the long durée, help us take better grasp of, of the present moment and the fields that we study uh, so closely. So thank you both for the wide ranging, the insightful, the enlightening conversation. Uh, we will not have a speaker series uh, event next week, but we will um, finish up with three last events after Thanksgiving. Um, focused on intimate privacy policies on platforms, um, the future of social media research with all the changing API policies, and then also a deep dive into the Facebook election studies um, as well. So thank you once again, Malcolm and Eric, and we hope to see you all on Zoom or in person in Cambridge for our last couple of events. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thanks, all. Bye.